Hey everyone, this is Sam Hudson speaking from thisquality.com. I am the CEO of thisquality.com and today's episode we have a special guest and his name is Billy Tekahika. He is the co-leader of Advance NZ and the leader of NZPP. So hello, how's it going? Good. Good. No problem. So in today's interview, we're just going to clear up a few things, get to know Billy, and just talk a little bit of politics and and environment, uh, economy, and just a few other personal comments that Billy might want to express in front of you guys as an audience to get to know him a little bit better. What what is your past, Billy? I always like to say that I'm as every day as fish and chips in New Zealand. Um, um, typical Kiwi uh, Kiwi boy, um, Maori father, Pākehā mum, um, grew up in a, in a state house in, in Māngere and then moved to Papatai and um, so definitely definitely a South Auckland boy and <laughs> um, self-starter, um, uh, got into music very very young, my father's a very well known musician, uh, mm-hmm. Billy TK, I'm Billy TK Jr, I've travelled the world since I was 21 playing on uh, international stages and uh, I've played, played guitar for some pretty big stars in my time and toured with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always had a parallel b- business as well, so I've, I've been a, um, uh, I've had national corporate roles with some of our larger snack food companies, I've worked with Lion Breweries, Eater, Griffins, I've had contracts working in overseas gov- uh, governments and countries and tourism and events in mm-hmm. the South Pacific. Um, but proudly so, I'm a very, very much a uh, happy and in love husband, uh, father of six, grandfather of two, mm-hmm. and um, uh, my wife and I, we have a little ministry at times when, when we're able to do it, taking care of people on the streets of Auckland uh, that mm-hmm. are homeless and, um, and need help. Um, and I look after a poor flock sometimes in, in, in Whangarei where we live um, to uh, to fellowship with, um, but um, I've also had um, other careers where I've worked, where I've deviated off into the military and police. Um, but very much a community person. I've always cared about the community ever since I was a young man. Mm, I, I was, wow. I, yeah, I was 15 and I was a naval cadet in the naval cadets, and uh, we used to um, you know take care of all the old soldiers on Anzac Day. Mm, and uh, wow. so, but definitely, yeah, but definitely a community-minded person. I, I, I do. I care deeply for the welfare of all people. And and just a little side question: When you worked at Griffins, did they give you biscuits uh, every week? Every week. <laughs> That's the perks, <laughs> isn't it? That's the perks. I love it. Yeah. Well, Griffins, yeah, Griffins also had either chips as well and peanuts. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so, man, I used to every Friday I used to fill up my box and full of chips and cookies and peanuts, you name it, and um, wow. I'd be up for, with, uh, with, my, with my happy pack. <laughs> um, okay, so the second question I have is in regards to your personality and stuff, what are your values? What are you like aiming for? Well, number one, I think that the yeah, um, values are, number one, pretty simply, that everybody has a right to, to, to live freely and understood by government. Mm, mm. Um, and you know, as long as what we do doesn't negatively impact or hurt another soul, mm. we should be we should be free to live that life that we choose to live without any overreach of government into that life. And that's very much a biblical perspective as well, where mm. you know, freedom of conscience, freedom to to live um, undisturbed with, with your whānau. And um, so that's, I guess, the the number one value that I have. Wow, well, wow. really appreciated. Impressive, and I assume that's very inquisitive of you. What made you join the political space? Like, was it because of the higher up people that are in charge in this country, um, or is it something else? Uh, something to do about your beliefs? Yeah, it really, it really um, began in in late February, sort of March, when the COVID nineteen lockdown was imposed upon New Zealanders, where I. Um, you know, just like everyone else, I was deeply concerned that we were going to um, see a, a, a highly lethal um, virus uh, amongst mm. our population. So I was one of the first to lock our whānau down. We live on a farm, so we mm. just locked down and totally distanced ourselves and all that, and that was all good. But after a couple of weeks of it, it started to look very, very weird to me. I started mm. to really mm. study the situation, analysing the geopolitics of it all, looking at the... Uh, the, the chain of people connected in this saga 
and um, some very, very serious questions arose from that. I also know from a biblical point of view that that the books of Daniel and Revelation talk very clearly that something was coming down the line. They actually describe what that is, and I was mm. able to, mm. to cross-reference that to what I was seeing. So what I did was I started doing live broadcasts, um, um, lecturing on the geopolitics of and, and the biblical nature of what I was seeing, and the, the live broadcast just went totally bananas, went viral, and then slowly but surely over a period of weeks, you know, it went from fives, tens of thousands to, to hundreds of thousands of people dial in, dialing mm. in. And, wow. then, and then with that, a demand to stand up and, and, and fight, for, fight for the people of New Zealand that, that were awake to what's going on. Mm. None, mm. Of the, none of the political mm. parties and political mm. uh, personalities were saying anything about the concerns that, that are very real. They're not conspiratorial. They are very real. And um, nobody was standing up for, for ordinary New Zealanders like, like me and saying these things. So I got asked time and time again to stand. It wasn't something that I wanted to do. I certainly have never had any desire to be mm. a parliamentarian or an MP. Mm. Um, but, I, but you know, after some deep soul searching and refusing to do it, I, I, I decided to make that stand on behalf of all good, free thinking mm. uh, and reasonable people in New Zealand. And, and this is where I am today. Wow. It's very, very cool. And, and how you've You've developed the social media uh, personality, and just to think of it, um, you know, you you probably influence a lot of people just uh, coming along to the social platform, and um, in this political spectrum and world of things. And just another side question: How is how is does that make you happy? Um, since you're a people person, does that kind of make you happy? Uh, that you're telling people stuff that inspires them too. Well, I wish. I wish honestly. I I really, really wish it was a bad dream, and that I was going to wake up and my regular life was going to be, be as it was. Um, um, I'm happy. I'm. Yeah, it's a strange question. I've never been answered it, but it's a good question because I'm not ha happy about having to do it, but I'm happy to to be doing it to help people realise. Mm. what this government is up to, what the risks are mm. involved in the way this government is behaving and also the risks associated with a national-led um, uh, government coming into into play as well because it's our view that, that the National Party will do the same things as this Labour government but do it in a much slower and different way and what's yeah. required is a people's movement to bring balance. What do you think of New Zealand as a country, uh, as in diversity co or, or culture? <clears throat> I think New Zealand as an Aotearoa is a, is a beautiful country. I think we've got a proud indigenous whānau, mm. i.e. Māori people. I believe that gives us a unique identity. I believe that the Kiwiana culture of, um, of Pākehā people gives us a rich and beautiful history too. And um, I think... I th Generally speaking, I think we're a good people in our country. Mm. I think the cultural diversity, if we have people in our country that from different cultural backgrounds that truly want to contribute the best of what they've got to what we've got, then mm. I, think that, I think that's a good thing. I think the problem that you have is when you have um, such a small country as this and it's such a tight, generally a tight community, um, is if you're, um, you know, if immigration policies aren't aren't right and they're not reasonable and they're not protective and, and yet inviting, then what you have is you, you, you can quite easily lose your cultural identity in New Zealand and that's something we need to be aware of. But at the same time we need to embrace people that want to become want to mm. become Kiwis and New Zealanders and we need to you know, the, the Maori word is Manaki Tanga, Manaki. We need to yeah. we need to treat them well and, and feel the love. Okay, now going into the politics. What does the NZPP slash Advance NZ stand for uh, in New Zealand? Well, number one, it's about restoring doc democracy in our country. Democracy has been absolutely smashed over by this government. And so um, our number one pillar that we stand on is, is, is about restoring democracy to New Zealand. The next one is about government accountability and integrity and making sure that this that those two principles are enshrined in the heart of the way that the government operates. Mm -hmm. The third thing is um, economic prosperity and recovery so that we um, stop the, the destruction of our economy and our financial and fiscal well-being in this country by this government and replace it with a strategy that's really going to get us, um, you know, uh, recovering quicker, yes. performing better than what we had before, but also, uh, you know, just, you know, defend, defending our, um, our, our national sovereignty 
protecting our environment. So those are probably the, and medical medical sovereignty and health sovereignty. Yeah. So those are the key things that we stand for. And how can the NZPP slash Advance NZ parties as a combination make a change for New Zealanders? Well, we're very fortunate in, in Advance New Zealand. So I just want to be clear to people when they, unless they're in my seat in Te Tai Tokiro, the party voters Advance mm. New Zealand. We are, we are in a very, very fortunate position that we've got a very, very experienced sitting MP in Jamie Lee Ross, who is my co-leader in Advance New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And what we have is we've got somebody that knows how to implement and execute um, policies and so that they can happen. And when you have that, you've got someone that can actually en enable your policies into life. Because mm -hmm. what happens is that a lot of, a lot of um, new political parties as well, and in fact, when I look at um, all of the other minor parties, none of them have um, any experience actually working within the the, the, the halls of, of the beehive and know how to know how to um, use the levers of of power that gets things going in there. And what we do have is that we've got that in Jamie Lee Ross. We've got great great policies. I'm a deep thinker around some of those issues, but we actually know how to how to get things done through that. So we're very, very fortunate to be able to do that. How many people are actually involved as a number uh, in advancing this change for the better in New Zealand? And and that includes like how many are in your team? Okay, so we've got um, um, in the in the candidate area, we've got around about sixty candidates, which oh, yeah. makes us makes us a, a very large party. To begin mm, with, on that mm, note, mm. we've got over, we've got seven thousand registered members thereabouts, and uh, that's a huge number of people just in ten weeks that we've had sign up for us. We have been the fastest growing new political party in the history of New Zealand politics. <laughs> yeah. um, we in, in in my executive team. There's about um, about six of us that work in that, including myself and and Jamie Lee. We've got a policy team which is separate to that, so people developing and writing. Uh, policy as well and that's mm. a very 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 good team and that involves a number of our candidates involved in that um, we've got hundreds of people across New Zealand that work in regional uh, teams as well we, and they have what we call uh, team captains that look after those oh, yeah. teams and, and their and their role is to make sure that our billboards are out that messaging is out that people are coordinated candidates are assist so it's a massive team um, we've had over two million people engage in our message now wow. and uh, which, which makes us very very big in, in terms of that we we outperform labor and national and all, all parties on social media rankings we're number one and so this is a um, and, and and we're the only party that is that has gained um, international profile and presence as well does nzpp slash advance nz believe democracy doesn't exist uh, in this current generation slash uh, this country called new zealand and why doesn't it exist? Well, number one is, um, so we can, well, let's talk about the now and, and, and mm. current tense. So mm. what we have now is that we've got a government that has no problem in during a lockdown when parliamentary parliament is suspended mm. and bringing in laws and without uh, without the proper um, public and, and select, uh, select committee oversight on those laws and how they're framed and what the intent is, how mm. they could be reinterpreted how they could be defined, none of that's been done. And this government um, has failed the, democ the democratic process by, mm. by introducing laws without the, the requisite oversight. The COVID-19 health um, response bill, public health response bill, is the most draconian, broad, far-reaching um, bill we've ever seen pushed into law. And this government did it very, very sneakily. It did it without um, with accountability and transparency. And when you examine what's contained in the in the COVID-19 Public Health Response Bill, you can see very, very clearly that it has the potential to be defined in any which way this government so chooses to restrict rights and freedoms. And so when you have a government um, also that ad hocly decides to um, use um, a national crisis to bring in these laws without following dem democratic processes, mm. then you can be sure that democracy has been destroyed. See, democracy, Sam, is the is the government tool um, tool to mm. to make sure that freedoms are maintained? When that right. is broken down, like what we have here now, then you've got a fa failure of of democracy in a country, and that's when you get people that are now being detained in detention centres um, um, as part of the COVID nineteen uh, response by the government. It's distressing people. It's locking people down. 
it's, which is causing you know mass distress, suicides, um, destroying businesses and economies oh. without without the proper accountabilities in place. Mm. So that mm. when the people say no, we're not sure about this, slow it all down. That that's indeed what happens. But that's that's been eradicated. Any any opportunity for that is not there. This government can do what it's like, and that's a major major serious concern. So mm. no, we do not have democracy in New Zealand right now. Mm. And just just a side question on that one. When the first lockdown did happen, uh, when the laws were passed, as far as we know, from our research at least, it wasn't announced at the Beehive from the government that these laws were in place, um, that people didn't have a time to review it and whatnot. They only had, I, don't, I can't recall how long, but we'll Five probably hours. edit it in. But it wasn't long. And it, is that fair? Is that fair to the democracy of, of New Zealanders for fast-tracking a, a law that could potentially be abused by police officers and uh, you name it? Yeah, exactly, Sam. You did right. So the, the way that this was rushed, and I believe it was, it, it was introduced into the House um, as a new bill around about mm. four in the morning. And so, you know, that's, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm normally snoring at four o'clock in the morning. Mm. And then it was like, <laughs> read into the House, you know, later that morning, and uh, and adopted so you know very 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 quickly without those um, uh, checks and balances that we need to have in place to know as a as a as, as the public to know that our government's doing the right thing and the reality of it is this this bill the way that it's been um, defined and and interpreted by this government you know the reality of it is we do have soldiers on the streets now performing some of the roles of of police and why I say that is I drove through a checkpoint the other day. Um, I had a young soldier, um, you know, I'm ex-army, a young soldier politely asked me, you know, what I was doing, you know, where am I going, um, you know, all that and the rest of it. And, you know, really, if I was going to be a, a naughty man, I could have said, well, I'm not telling you, go away. And um, done all that because at the end of the day, when you, when you um, as someone that works for the government, asks anyone something, it, it really needs to be, um, through a um, through the generosity of compliance that you answer those questions when they're not a police constable mm. and but what's happening is is that um, that uh, in the presence of a police constable these soldiers now have the ability to be able to do that they now have extra powers as granted to them to, by the Ministry of Health to um, tell people to stay in their rooms at the detention centre to question mm. them take their details and all that and once upon a time, I couldn't have imagined that happening in New Zealand, and here we have have that. Also, you know, the, the Ministry of Health and can designate, authorise people to to go onto your property, onto your land and workplace, and remove you to perform a um, a, a medical examination or procedure on you without um, without a warrant. Mm. And so, you know, that that's that, that's you know, I'm sorry, that's not that's not democracy in in, in a functioning democratic society and I, I can't bring my opinion into it but removing people's rights to privacy um, when an officer can just come in without a warrant and say come on you, you're gonna get taken away for what your family from your family for whatsoever ever reason um, and do you think it's it's really fair for families if that were to happen well well, it's not fair, and it is happening. So what mm. you have right now is that you have the government able to to enforce um, um, this this COVID nineteen mm. public health mm. response bill on families. If, if mum tests um, uh, positive and the child doesn't, they will mm. split those two two individuals up, mm. and they're doing it right now. You know, they and they can walk into a, they can walk into any environment, and if you if someone tests um, positive, they can remove that person and take and, them into a detention centre. And they introduce an application system to literally go and see your family members uh, at a centre where they hold someone that could potentially have COVID um, and still require tests, even if they don't have it. Some people say that if you do get denied, um, do you still have contact with your family? Now, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield has said at a press conference that contact with family will be, uh, you know, managed and traced as much as possible. Uh, and so they're connected and they're, they're not apart. Do you believe uh, they're going to stick to that word? 
Well, I'd question everything that, that Bloomfield says, and I would mm. question anything that the government um, government says because they're changing their minds, they're changing the the goalposts and where they're set every t- every time. I mean, you know, when you know the government's announced um, a two point five lockdown status in Auckland. Well, you know, come on, give us a break. You know, it, w- it was first of all it was lockdown four, three, two, and one. Now they've created an extra one. You know, they're making this up as they're going along. But no, I don't trust it because. Um, I've been speaking to families that are in these uh, COVID-19 detention centres. They don't know what's going on. There's always the risk they'll be separated um, from each other. Um, there's no recourse uh, for them. Uh, some of these people don't even know what their rights are. They're not being clearly explained to the people in these detention centres. Mm. And I'm sorry, that's just not good enough, whichever way. So I don't trust this government. I don't trust um, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield uh, because uh, you know, a week and a half ago, he was saying that there were COVID-19 cases at Pakaranga High School. Um, mm. That very afternoon, the the principal of the school released released a press release, um, mm. and also the the local Pakaranga MP saying there were no cases in this high school, and that it caused such distress and panic um, that it just through it was just created pandemonium. And so, when you have oh, yeah. the director general, when you have the director general saying that, and then changing this and and getting such a thing wrong. You can't trust them, you know. Also, mm, mm. we said the other day, Sam, that that the government was lining up to test seventy thousand Maori and Pacific people in South and West Auckland, and we 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 made a uh, media announcement of that. We stood against that, um, uh, any type of mandatory testing like that, and um, and then what happens yesterday? Jacinda Ardern um, says that that was a uh, promotional PR person's mistake that they shouldn't have said that. That's a complete lie because it's right. in, it, was, it was in four different sites where the MOH right. and the government had released that that's what they were going to do, but they ended up changing their mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think the follow-up on that, um, we can go in depth on that, on the about, we'll just keep on the questions at the moment. I've got a couple of notes that we can talk about afterwards. So moving on, what are six immediate uh, actions that, Advance NZ and NZPP will take uh, should you get in Parliament? Number one, we're going to repeal the, the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act. Number two, we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to set up an independent um, People's Commission of Scientists and Doctors that are going to totally investigate independently of the government and MOH um, a, the best um, approach to managing COVID-19. Mm. Uh, we don't we don't believe that the that the way that the MOH is is functioning is based on scientific um, and medical facts, um, and that's substantiated by the fact they're now contradicting the WHO and the CDC's own advice that they originally acted upon. So what we want to do is that we want to set up an independent um, people's commission to totally investigate that and and navigate the plan to how New Zealand should be responding to it. Number three, we're going to set up a um, an economic uh, recovery and prosperity committee that is going to be designed to interface with with the uh, with the export sector and product productivity sectors and SME sectors, so that we can understand um, how much money that New Zealand and revenue New Zealand can earn um, uh, and attract in terms of new money into our country because that's what we need in New Zealand. And then the fourth thing we're going to we're going to want to do is set up a um, a people's commission based on that to investigate how. Um, um, this government has spent money and borrowed money. That's really, really important. We, we don't believe the government is transparent enough on that. Uh, number five, we're going to also um, mm. going to ha- totally look at some of the international agreements that affect our country and our sovereignty, mm. and we're going to investigate those. and um, And that includes um, totally removing any chance for communist Chinese party. Um, um, Influence in our country and in the parties, we're going to we're going to um, want to investigate how the parties, such as Labour and National, have interfaced with funding from the CCP. Mm. And then the last thing we last thing I guess in terms of of um, imperatives is that we're going to look at our um, um, at our national um, debt and how we're going to going to deal with it. And that's part of our broader economic policy. Yeah. That's pretty high at the moment. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. There's a couple of there's a couple of other immediate priorities in that as well. You know that that um, are equally as important. But number one is is de- democracy. If we don't get that right and get the government accountable and get that integrity and accountability in that, then then we will always be 
on the back foot with the government that intends to have people serve it rather than it serve the people. Yes, so onwards onto the economy. Once the pandemic settles down, um, the country will be in a bad recession, like you said. Um, what are NZPP slash Advance NZ's policies and plans to rebuild NZ economically, socially, and spiritually? Okay, so there's three separate questions there. So the first one is around economy. So the number one, number one thing is is that we know that New Zealand is a is the breadbasket of the world. We've got produce and export produce and commodities that um, that the world wants. So we need to be able to look at how we can super super boost productivity. Uh, to attract the export dollar. Second thing is to have a look at the entire um, tax situation so that businesses are, are generating revenue, keeping as much of it as they can to reinvest into their businesses so that the super size can occur, but also that enough revenue can be handed back to the government to be able to do its thing. Um, so taxation um, reform is going to be a real big part of that strategy so that, that, that ordinary people aren't paying um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is whether GST should be on on fruits and vegetables. I personally believe it shouldn't be, and mm. so we need to be, so you know tax reform is a part of that. Um, but certainly, as I just said in, in my previous uh, response, you know, um, overall business health is what it's going to come down to, and also addressing the the major contribution that SMEs make mm. to the New Zealand economy is really really super important. Mm. And uh, and you know the provincial growth fund that's. Uh, that has been managed by my Minister Shane Jones has been a total failure, and it's been a it's been a fund really for big business and for councils to apply for for funding support. But what what I believe should be should happen is is that localised funds should be set up to help SMEs in the provinces uh, be able to grow. I'm a big believer that there's a lot of land that's been unused out there that if that if um, supported could be turned into productivity, and I want to examine those. Um, within the economic portfolio is also look at our, our tra international trade deals and find out what's involved with those so that we're not losing we're not losing opportunities for increased revenue and that we're not giving our products away and certainly not giving our sovereignty away. So that, that's a quick snapshot around that and it's really important that we understand the contribution of the of the big players, something like the private sector and tourism sectors, you know, number uh, number one and two, number one and two, you know, um, agriculture primary sector number one contributed to GDP followed by by tourism and those right now have been absolutely destroyed by this government so we need to look at those and get get that working again as quickly as we can through a safe um, um, border policy as well that's going to protect our people but allow um, um, you know um, a careful managed um, tourism economy to be rebooted um, socially I think socially what we need to do is that the way that the government's managing COVID-19 is it's it's using it's you know the way that it's creating this you know um, fear campaign against people is is also causing a social divide you know now if you if you're in an area full of people not wearing a mask if someone walks in wearing a face mask people look weird and then if you go into a situation where people everyone's wearing masks and you're not people will look at you like you're weird and dangerous um, and we don't believe that that's um, that that's appropriate. We certainly see enough evidences now from the CDC again um, saying that face masks actually don't help prevent any spread of any type of viral disease such as this. Um, and in fact, they make you um, unhealthier because it affects your immune system if you if you block your face and your nose from breathing fresh air and having continual exposure to viruses. That's what strengthens the immune system. Mm. So uh, you know the social. Social hangover is, uh, at the moment that we're going through is is growing because they're using fear as a as a base to create division. And you know we've we've seen that in and you know protests in New Zealand around Black Lives Matter. Well, we believe that all lives matter. So the social mm -hmm. thing is if we can open up freedom again and relax, people will get to know that real experts are looking at the at how to fix our economy, how to protect the community community's health then that makes people just take that little bit of a deep breath and relax a little bit. Yeah, so that's a big question, Sam, around spirituality. Um, you know, I'm obviously um, a committed Christian in my walk, and, you know, I believe as a Christian that um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, but my position as a, as a politician is that I would absolutely defend anyone's right to believe whatever they will. Um, I come from a diverse um, spiritual background in my whanau, and, um, and whilst I may not agree with it, I would... I would you know, I would wholeheartedly defend anyone's right to believe as they want to believe. That's a, that's the individual's 
God-given right to believe as they will. So spiritually, and what I'd like to see is that a lot of people, a lot more people, are happier walking around than what we have at the moment. There are some very, very concerned and distressed people out there. How do I know that? Because I hear from dozens and hundreds of them a week, thousands of them a week. And so, um, what I'd like to see is that once we do restore democracy, get our economy moving forward, and protect protect our sovereignty, protect people's individual sovereignty. Uh, then hopefully we'll see a few more happier people walking out. What are your honest opinions on the environment in New Zealand and is it being treated fairly? Well, um, yeah, you know, I think the I think the Greens now are no longer the Greens of yesteryear. I mean, the Green Party, when they first came out, they blazed a really positive trail across the, um, the political atmosphere, uh, stratosphere, but, you know, they've, they've really just become an environmental extension to the Labour Party. Uh, one of the things that concerns us um, is that they they used to have Agenda 21 Sustainable Development Program in their in their uh, list of, of philosophies and principles that they support. That's the very thing that we're against because whilst we are totally environmentalistic in our party, we don't believe that Agenda 21 Sustainable Development, which is a United Nations program, is is a is a viable and appropriate and right option for New Zealand. Why? Because it destroys. Um, personal freedoms again, and that's what we're fighting for here. Um, in terms of environmentalism, you know, number one is we need to get out, rid of any type of poisons in our in our um, in our soil and our water table, and that and that starts with 1080. 1080 is not the only poisonous thing that this government is using on our land, and we need to investigate those, find out what's um, 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 what's involved in in the, the rollout of of massive raining down of 1080 across our land and we need to stop it immediately. These are the things that we can do to get rid of pests rather than destroy our soil and water table. Mm. So we want to look at those, but also I want to take that a step further. I want, I, I, again, within these people's commissions that we're wanting to set up, we do want to um, uh, investigate who's been involved in, in the 1080 businesses that have uh, been making loads of money out of the government uh, rolling out this destructive campaign. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting how you you want to investigate who is the, the cause of it. I've never heard someone say that before. Well, that's really important. There, there are a number of things. You see, this is this is what this, elect, this next election is really about. This is an opportunity for the people of New Zealand to have, have a party inside the parliament that's going to be a people's movement, a people's party that's there to serve the people in the interest of all New Zealanders. And so what that means is there are some serious questions that people want um, asked and answered, and we need to set, set up commissions to be able to do that, that are independent of parties to, to do that, and that they're in government, and that they can investigate these things. And um, they also need to have prosecut um, you know, um, prosecutorial um, um, authority as well. If people need to be... Um, to be tapped on the shoulder and say, excuse me, we feel you've broken the law here. We feel that you've acted um, dishonestly in a conflict of interest in your in your appointment in Parliament, or if you've committed treason, you need to answer the charges. And these these are the types of um, this is the type of authority that you that you need in these commissions. Uh, and it's it's kind of similar, but would be different to say the serious fraud office. We want pe we want these. Um, uh, th these commissions, they have real authority to get out there and do the business. And just going back to the investigation of the people, if you were to, for instance, get into Parliament, would you keep to your word to that and investigate those people? Uh, you know, like who's the top dog? Are you going to investigate them? Hundred percent, absolutely. It's what drives me. I want to find out. I want to find out why has our government destroyed our economy? Why has mm -hmm. our de government, through the mismanagement of COVID-19, had, had, um, um, you know, why have they, you know, made these decisions that have destroyed businesses, had business owners commit suicide, had people commit suicide, caused, you know, many, many undiagnosed people to become sicker because, you know, the repurposing of the medical system to deal with the apparent avalanche of COVID-19 victims that didn't come. I want, mm. I want answers to all of it. I want answers to what, why Jacinda Ardern has given money to the Clinton Foundation, 5.3 million of New Zealand taxpayer money given to a, an organisation that's under serious investigation for criminal conduct by the US State Department, the US Justice Department. I want to find out which of these relationships that, that Jacinda Ardern as our Prime Minister has had that may have 
lead to a conflict of interest. I want to ask those same questions of um, of the former Prime Minister John Key, Jenny Shipley, and beyond that. Back to 1080. What are your thoughts and stance on 1080 poison pellets and biodiverse life in the ground? Um, so this is like worms, um, insects, bugs. Um, you know, when they drop this stuff, do you like believe that it's actually killing off? Uh, you know the insects and bugs um, in the logical sense of it um, you know if if the if the birds are you know can't eat off the the insects do you believe that's why birds don't hang around drop zones I think that's a fact I think yeah, all you need to do is just to examine the um, you know the feedback that you get from people researching this topic that that speak from the ground I mean we've had uh, you know the target species of, of possums um, etc aren't the only animal life that's been killed you, you're getting farmers cattle you're getting farmers dogs you're getting birds you're getting you name it anything that eats it's dead you know um, and so they cannot you know it's a drag uh, Sam it doesn't distinguish between a, a possum and, a, and an iguana you know mm. to a it doesn't mm. distinguish between a kia and a possum, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't do that. It just kills. And um, and when you get into the bio, you know, the, the bio, um, uh, go, go right into the, the biometrics and of, um, of, you know, of our insects and mm. things that we need at the microbe level that, that need to be healthy to, to function because yeah. they affect everything else in the, in the, in the, in the soil, table, the water table and things like that. When those microbes and bacteria are getting slaughtered, then that affects every, everything else in that chain of life. So mm. what we need to do is, again, um, um, you know, stop the poisoning while we can and, and make sure that, again, independent people can get in there and research it, the better way to do it. And I see a money-making opportunity there for people as well. I, th- I believe that the bounty um, option around um, hunters getting um, getting uh, possums, et cetera, I think that's a good one. I've heard instances of businesses in Northland and Taitokiro, where I am, that have made plenty good money out of capturing um, uh, possums. We just need to be able to train people in that sector and get them out there. Just having a bit of network problems. Just wait for it to calm down again. <laughs> Once it loads. We, you might just notice that there's a change of scenery um, just because uh, Billy's had some network problems with Skype. So bear with us, we're getting there. I guess it's the same question um, about worms and stuff. Do you believe bird life is empty at drop zones because of, you know, no worms, there's nothing to eat? Since technically they have no food to eat and and thrive off of, um, as, and that's probably why they have hang out in civilizations instead of our backyard. Is that true? Yeah, personally, I haven't had a chance to research into that into that particular um, area. But I mean, it's just logical if if if, if an animal cannot um, live in its natural environment and and eat what it normally eats, it's gonna it's gonna forage, it's gonna leave its natural habitat to go and find food to survive. So I think that's I think that sounds very logical that if, um, um, you know, uh, any type of animal can't eat in its own habitat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to migrate out of that to find its food. Just watch Over the Hedge, you know, that's a big example of it. My kids have got the Over the Hedge uh, DVD and, yeah. um, and that's all about that. They couldn't, you know, they weren't getting enough food in their natural environment, so they hopped over the hedge and were That was actually were my favourite childhood show. show. <laughs> Childhood oh, movie, that was, that was a good one. That is actually a good example of how, you know, a backyard is, you know, uh, potentially run out of food for this biodiverse life. And I guess just a side question, because um, I was burning to ask you this one personally, um, this is the only personal question I'll ask, is, um, is NZPP and Advanced NZ uh, going to enforce a study into biodiverse life uh, in 1080 drop zones and hard to reach areas um, just know the borderlines or anything like that and and be really transparent about uh, releasing that stuff to the public sector oh absolutely that's what it's all about that's I mean that's that's the the second part of our pillars that we stand on is government transparency to get these mm. um, um, you know get these things investigated and the information become discoverable and made yeah. public so that the public know exactly what's going on who's here in the zoo involved in it mm. and um you yeah, know that's absolutely 150 150 percent awesome thanks for that i've got a question on environment about petitions so instead of petitions um which sometimes don't even work uh 
at the least most of the times um, you'll see a petition on the government website and you know there's there's a lot of signatures but nothing happens uh, what is another way you can use uh, to that could inf influence others uh, to make a change for the environment other than petitions well that's exactly right so so there there is there is nothing um, within our constitutional framework that means a petition uh, is worth anything so um, and that's a major major problem you know you, you meet great people that go and get 500,000 signatures for a cause and then they take it to the government slam it on the government's desk and the government goes hey thanks very much that's great that you got mm. 500,000 signatures catch you later have a great day mm. thanks for the memories um, so, so really, what we need to do, we need to set up a direct democracy situation within government, so that, so that the direct democracy is 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 made functional by way of referenda, so mm. that they're, they're not just petitions; that they are binding referenda, so that the big issues are are made relevant and made public, and that people know exactly what's going on, and they can respond and decide on the big key issues. So. Um, you know, I, I appreciate all the effort that goes, that, that goes into these petitions, but it, because of where we are right now, they really are pretty much a waste of time. Yes, it does show anecdotal support for a particular uh, view, and that's good for politicians to know that because it can sometimes modify, modify behaviour, but what you want really is to be guaranteed that, that the government's um, uh, modification of their behaviour is, is made through legislation or power and authority and that's through the constitutional system that would um, recognize a referenda and um, and bring that into law mainstream media and social media have you been treated fairly using social media in terms of growth uh, impressions and communication with your followers oh absolutely so so i mean i've i've had i've had a couple of close run-ins with with facebook um, but um, I think what they've realised is um, that New Zealand's a lot different to America. If they want to squash someone down, then they can, you know, sometimes they can do that and not get mm. paid attention. But not not New Zealand old Aotearoa. It's pretty much if they close me down tomorrow, um, the world will know about it in New Zealand. So, mm. so what we want to be able to do is to, um, um, you know, is to make sure that we use the social media platform in the right way. But we are by far the um, the, the highest rank uh, highest rank political party in New Zealand um, in social media. We've had over two two million engage, uh, engagements in, um, in our in our message, a um, couple of couple of million views of, of our of our announcements. Mm -hmm. um, so social media, social media has been good to us, but um, it's not the only avenue. We know that, so we are mm -hmm. proof sourcing. Um, other areas where well, if it came down tomorrow we could still get our message out there yeah but it has been good in reference to mainstream media i think they're learning now that they they should start and have started to to acknowledge us and we've crossed a hump in the in the in the landscape from being a um irrelevant um of, you know party to now we are we are very much relevant you know as, as you know those numbers i gave earlier um, means that they can't ignore us and they can't say that we're fringe because the concerns that we have are, are what mainstream New Zealand has. And so there's, um, um, you know, I had a debate, a very, very strong debate mm. with, a, um, with a political uh, correspondent the other day on a major, major TV show. And all that happened there was that, um, is that you know, I made him look silly because he was uninformed. And I'm strong enough to argue my point and, um, mm. and make sure that... that that the demand to attention to that point is made in the right way, and um, and so what's going to happen is, is that mainstream media will have to modify its approach with us because we are relevant. We've got a huge number of people in New Zealand now thinking that we are relevant as well, and we and that's growing every day. So yeah. uh, mainstream media, despite being um, highly funded by this government, despite um, being funded by um, by uh, the the socialist government that we're seeing here. Um, are now having to wake up and um, and start to realise that they better be careful because mainstream New Zealand's watching them. <laughs> uh, do you believe social media has a future with politics, and should it interfere or steer clear, um, leaving it up to the management um, of parties like you to do the work? Well, it's just another platform, you know. So you know, um, social me social media is one of one of several platforms, as you know, that you need to embrace to be able to communicate a message out there. 
Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's very possible unless something else comes along that's totally, you know, innovative and new and, and fresh, I think social media is going to be a, a very, very strong avenue uh, for which uh, political parties can make their, make their stand and get their mm. message out clearly to the, to the masses. Yeah. Um, by any chance, have you heard of Parler? Oh, no. Parler is a social media platform, just like Twitter. No, 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 sorry, I have, pardon me, I yeah. didn't quite hear you. Have you guys considered using Parler? Yeah, it is. Um, we, we've got a range of, um, of, of digital strategies and, and, and different tools that we're looking at. Mm. So, um, you know, all, all of the normal ones, like, you know, we, we want to get our Instagram really cooking. You know, we've mm. got um, what's a, you know, Facebook, of course, but these other ones as well, like MeWe and all that that, we, that we're dealing with. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, no, we're open to looking at all sorts of um, digital outlets for our message. Do your thoughts on social media have uh, so much power, meaning that the next day you could potentially be banned for speaking your policies or thoughts? Well, I think there's always that, that risk. I mean, what they define, again, that's the problem when you get into censorship. Um, you know, Tracy Martin, the New Zealand First MP, she introduced the internet um, filtering bill, which again, you know, um, let's be let's be real. We're not talking about allowing shots of terrorism, shots of, you know, horrible stuff online. That's mm. not what we're talking about. We totally we totally stand that that stuff needs to be eradicated from public view. But um, when when you have a government that has the potential to define the, the, the terms of references each each you know any way they want mm. or to mm. you know, interpret and define its application that's when you're going to get into trouble and what's happening is with Facebook which is very very leftist centric um, you know um, and it's um, and the way that it responds to this government especially you know very very biased very lefty um, it's, it, is, it is possible that they could um, use their community standards, which again, I'm not too sure how they define those standards. They seem to change them all the time. Mm. Um, if they do that, then um, they, you know there's a chance that we might sit outside those standards and they'll close us down. Mm. In regards to the vaccination comment, before I move on to that one, because we've got two little pointers of that one. Our company, This Quality, filmed Trevor Mullard taking out a COVID-19 health response bill sign uh, out of the parliament grounds and he didn't address the crowd or the protest group if you want to call it that um, but he did this after media left in regards to that the video posted about forced vaccinations on August 15 uh, was it doctored or manipulated? Well absolutely so the, the, the issue that they're saying is around the edit is it's, it looks at they, they're claiming that the edit changes the the um, the intent of the statement and it doesn't it doesn't at all and it, it, it has nothing to do with it. Um, Minister Woods, Megan Woods again, it stands there very clearly to say that the, that the that the bill that that she's talking about, i.e., COVID nineteen public health response bill, that there's every chance that it could require somebody taking a mandatory um, a mandatory uh, uh, vaccination. You know, and and sorry, that's not acceptable to us. We don't believe that's appropriate. We don't believe it's democratic. We certainly don't believe that it's right to do so. Um, you know, that, that can't be argued with. She says that. She says it on a couple of occasions. But what you have is that you have the Speaker of the House, who's a Labour list MP, Trevor Maillard, um, who has politicised um, his position as the Speaker of the House to try and, um, you know, censure us for making these, um, yeah. uh, you know, taking this footage and, and, and broadcasting it widely out there. So we're not going to fall for that. We're, we're holding that ground. We're not going to take it down. And we're prepared to face the uh, Privileges Committee to do that. Jamie Lee Rice is a sitting MP, um, has, is, is a strong as a strong MP in his, mm. and um, and at the conference with me, we both decided, no, bring it on, we'll both face the Privileges Committee. Mm. And in regards to the vaccination comment, before I move on to that, because we've got two little pointers after that one. So for one, our company filmed, our film, we filmed Trevor Mullard taking out a COVID-19 health response bill sign out of the parliament grounds, and he didn't address this protest at all but he tried to create trouble after media left. In regards to that, the video posted on August 15 uh, about vaccinations that you did, 
uh, was it doctored or manipulated? And in relation to our video that we filmed with Trevor Mullard um, taking out the COVID nineteen health sign, health response sign. Sorry, um, is that do you, do you think that's just hatred towards the COVID health act? Yeah, well, it, it's you know as the government said, you know Jacinda has said in such a con- con- condescending and uh, incre- incredibly amazing way that that the um, the government is the only only channel of truth, source of truth in re- regards to COVID nineteen. I'm sorry, that that's what a tyrant says. That's what's a that's what a dictator says, mm. and that behaviour is 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 evident all through the way that this government is managing everything from from you know what we've been talking about all through this interview sam you know the issue is is that this government is acting like it is uh, um it is beyond reproach it is um unaccountable to the public well i'm sorry you know new zealand government labor party you're in you you, <laughs> you know we're giving you notice that no that's not acceptable behavior mm-hmm. you're not the only source of truth especially when it comes to what you're doing here and destroying rights and privileges uh, well, rights and freedoms, not a privilege. You're born with those rights and freedoms. Mm. And, um, no, they're turning it into a privilege now. And so, uh, no, so in answer to your question, no, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the video that we've highlighted in our, in our post hasn't been um, mis- mis- misrepresented the statement of Minister Woods when she said that, that that law can be used if required to make people take vac- vaccinations. Now, what we're saying is, also, and we found other documentation where the government is saying on the Ministry of Health website that there is a framework, some of this, pay attention, mm. that there is the potential for the government to have a confirmation of immunisation before someone can return to work. Mm. If a lockdown is imposed, where that, where that happens. And that, so that could be anything, right? Well, well, it's it's you know what are they talking about the a COVID nineteen jab? What are they talking about? It, it just says immunisation, and so um, you know we 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 just need to keep this government accountable. The way that Trevor Mallard um, responded at that protest out on the front of mm. the Beehive, yeah, um, just just showed what contempt and arrogance and that, that, could that be the anything, Labour Party right? has towards um, New Zealanders, and it's not to be stood for. We're standing up against it at Advanced New Zealand. And um, we've got news uh, for Trevor Mallard that we won't be won't be taking that type of behaviour uh, lightly, and uh, he's on notice. Do you have any grudges or, or comments to the media in New Zealand to be less biased and let voices have a platform? And what needs to change? Uh, and have you thought about creating a regulation kind of policy that makes media less biased and equal in terms of? Interviews, politics, clickbait, in anything else, really. I think I think what happens is there needs to be a, a you know again this comes down to you know thinking through the the free speech element and and um, you know looking at it and understanding what that actually means you know so I think everybody there needs to be fair fair uh, restriction on speech that's that's ugly that's untrue and all that that's we we know about that right? that's that's a given but. Um, you know what the, the 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 media needs to be held accountable as well by the by the public and, and within within a um, a bill that can be introduced into into law that says if it can be proven that a media has acted with bias of any kind that it can lose its license you know it's mm. as simple as that mm. and when you start when you start putting those sorts of things in place you'll find that democracy will be well and truly upheld by these media channels because if they don't meet those standards they're gone Awesome. Moving on to the conspiracies uh, really quickly. Um, I'll skip the first question, uh, but I'll move it on to some people have speculated that you've done work with China under the UN, and you've probably got this a lot, <laughs> and you've had to repeat this so many damn times. Um, would you mind explaining and clearing anything up? Uh, just a little brief description um, under the UN-China relationship that you had. Sure. Okay. So yeah, you're right. I've dealt with this a few few dozen times now. But look, it's it's really clear. Number one, um, uh, in regards to uh, China, I was a part of a of a conference in Auckland. I got invited to go along there and talk about Maori business, and I was a representative of some Wai Fano that have um, Maori businesses in farming, etc., and forestry. Mm. And um, I was very very happy to be only um, you know three Maori that were invited to attend this thing. Um, to go and speak about how good it is to do business with Māori. So that's that was that's all it was. It was an opportunity to do that. I did become a 
a member of a of an ongoing um, um, advisory board uh, around Māori economy to this to this network, which was mm. Chinese. Um, but it didn't take us long, a few months, to realise that it was going to go nowhere. Um, what they were uh, asking of of Māori businesses in terms of participation, and we didn't agree with, so I totally withdrew out of that. And and to highlight that too is that they offered me a free trip to China, all expenses paid, and all this and the rest of it. And myself and another and another very prominent Māori man, uh, we both declined that and rejected the invitation to go to China on what we call a junket, and uh, because we didn't believe that there was any benefit to our people to do that. So um, we 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 absolutely got. Um, um, we, we absolutely got out of that. And not only that, in our party, one of our policies is, is to end uh, Chinese Communist Party influence in New Zealand and that and to also do a complete canvas of of what's been done to date that might be questionable and also to protect us uh, moving forward from that type of um, from that type of involvement of a, of a, a foreign party that just fundamentally um, is against what we stand for in New Zealand as a whole. Uh, the other question around the United Nations, I went to the United Nations to um, to meet Helen Clark to try and hustle some money out of the United Nations to hold a big indigenous um, um, cultural festival here in New Zealand. And um, I'd been to the, um, the the Indigenous World Games in Brazil and I looked at those and thought, hell, that, that, these are great things to do. Um, got back to New Zealand, went around the, the, the Māori agencies, they were useless to deal with, the Pawnee Kōkiri was hopeless, uh, the, the then CEO back in 2016 didn't really mm. understand the benefits to our, our people here, which were immense mm. from a cultural, economic and knowledge share um, perspective and cultural well-being, she didn't get any of that. So what I did is I hopped the plane with a couple of my, my colleagues, Māori colleagues, and as a private business, we went to go and meet um, Helen Clark and present what we thought was a really significant opportunity. And whatever, you know, like a good, true politician tells you, tells you to your face that this is great and something that they can support. But the problem was is that the United Nations wanted us to become a, a status group within the, within the United Nations framework as an NGO. And I refused absolutely without second thought mm. to do that because I know, what, I know what's um, within the United Nations. I've studied it for years and I was only there to try and get some of its money out of them, mm. not to become a part of, not to become a part of a of the problem and because you know what what it taught me right then and there is is how token um, the United Nations system is towards indigenous people all they want to do really is get indigenous people to jump on their um, jump on their waka and support what they want to do to, to destroy freedoms around the world and of course um, you know we weren't about to do that so that was the end of it right there and then yeah two questions um, <clears throat> This is this is completely away from the political spectrum to end it all off. What is your favourite thing to do um, in your leisure time away from politics? Spending time with my whānau, really. Um, yeah. That's, that, I love it. Um, I, you know, I love yeah. fishing as well when I get oh, a chance to awesome. do it. I love working on my little farm. Um, oh, awesome. And I love helping people. I really mm. do. I love doing Bible studies. I love um, when I get a chance to, to, to help people in trouble, to try and give people hope in all sorts of different areas of life that, you know, when people are challenged. Those are the things I like to do. Um, and, mm. of course, play my guitar, which I don't do much at the moment. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess the last one would be, um, if you could choose one thing that makes you inspired, what would that be? One thing that makes me inspired? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would be to see New Zealanders um, wake, wake up to what this government doing, uh, is doing to stand up for freedom and to vote Advanced New Zealand as the first ever truly People's Party that's going to get this government sorted out, sort out the parliamentary structure and create a system that will be serving the people rather than these people that have set up a system where they want the people to serve it. Mm. That would inspire me greatly mm. to believe that New Zealanders uh, are, are a strong and, and critical thinking free people. That would mm. be very inspirational. Just one more thing is if you'd like to add anything else uh, to our small audience, uh, what would you like to say to them? It could be anything, um, a comment, just feel free to what it, say whatever you want to say. Yeah, sure. Um, thank, look, Sam, thanks for today. Um, I've really enjoyed this interview. It's been really <laughs> relaxing. You had some really good penetrating questions. I guess the thing I'd say is that, you know, Advance New Zealand really does represent a real opportunity for change, a real opportunity where a, an independent party that's grown so large in 10 weeks 
mm. um, that is that is smart, that has policies, um, good people in it drafting those policies, um, and th- and in the core of our party, we are we are a party that's designed to, to protect our our country, protect our people, and that Advance New Zealand as an independent party is the very real very very real option to provide an alternative to the ping pong game that's put out play between Labour and National, Labour and National, Labour and National. No, we are a third option. And we believe that we're the only independent party that if you vote Advance New Zealand, you won't be wasting your vote. There's the very real risk of voting for the for minor parties that don't have the traction we have, that your vote's going to be lost and then it'll be redistributed out to the major parties. And um, that would be a massive, massive, massive waste of an opportunity. And what we need to do in New Zealand we need to be pragmatic. It's not about me. It's not about the party. It's about making sure that we have a mechanism that advanced New Zealand is inside inside the government to keep the, keep the government accountable, to to um, defend our sovereignty, and to get the system working for the people. And advanced New Zealand is that. And I'd like to encourage everyone to check us out um, online at our website www.nzpp.org. Go to our Facebook page, Advanced New Zealand NZPP. Um, all, all, all that we stand for is on there, but we are the real third option and we're the people's movement for Advance New Zealand. Your voice, because we do say the things that people don't want us to say. Your power, because we've been given the mandate ahead of any other party in New Zealand to make these stands. And we are, the, we are your party. Why? Because the people of New Zealand wanted this formed. We did it. We're here and we are going into government. Vote Advance New Zealand. Awesome. Bring it up for Billy Tekahika. And uh, be sure to follow them on Facebook if you agree with what, what has been said today. It doesn't matter if you disagree or not, but follow them if you want. Um, we're just here to try and give a real voice to people like Billy. Um, and, you know, the media, they, they pretend to argue and, and it should be just a civil conversation, just like this one. And, you know, so if you do want more interviews like this one, and if you do want to see a follow-up with Billy, just let us know. And we do really appreciate you coming on, uh, Billy, speaking to us to promote what you guys are doing and without being biased, basically, and and just inquire about what, what you're getting up to. And I think this interview will clear up a lot of things because it's been very, very civil, unlike the other interviews I've seen myself personally uh, and, and probably other people have seen, um, that, that mainstream of media not portraying interviews the right way and I'm sure I've asked you some some pretty hard questions that got you thinking and and that's that's how it should be so that's it for me and thanks so much Billy for coming on to today's uh, episode and yeah thanks for watching everyone. Kia ora. thank you, thanks Sam.